Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Water School webinar brought to you by ISWARM. And if you're a farming or water professional, environmental consultant, government agency into environment, this is the webinar for you today. Glad you're here. It's going to be good. We're delighted you can join us to discuss CSIRO's extensive research into Northern Australia's water resources. And it involves over 100 scientists across two and a half years, the largest multidisciplinary investigation of its kind. Uh, we're so glad you joined us that you can see on screen there, all over the globe. Wonderful to see you. Thank you for taking the time here. Today's webinar is going to be led by Q and Petherham, Andrew Ash, Chris Chilcott and Marcus Barber, all from Australia's leading research uh, science research agency, CSIRO. My name is Trevor Piller, National Partnerships Manager here at IceWarm and today's uh, webinar chair. You can see we've got coming up free webinars there, uh, building farm level capacities uh, in agriculture um, from Dr. Reddy and also groundwater modelling with Conrad and Wolfgang and how wrong is your flood model uh, from BMT and Bill Symes. So we really encourage you to look into our website and join us for those webinars and the online courses there you can see too. And four presenters today, well, Kewan's going to do the presentation and uh, we've got three other panellists. Uh, Kewan's a hydrogeologist and uh, uh, with CSIRO, uh, principal coming on screen now, principal research scientist at CSIRO. CSIRO. Um, uh, he's had 15 years experience working in Northern Australia and was a joint project leader of the Northern Australia Water Resource Assessment. Uh, good to see you, Kewan, Chris, Marcus, Andrew. I'll just go on. Um, with these um, introductions, if you like. Dr. Chris Chilcott is a research leader for Northern Australia and the Assistant Science Director at CSIRO, 20 years experience in the ag sector, research and development sector. Dr. Andrew Ash is a re Chief Research Scientist um, and has 30 years research experience. Marcus Barber is the Environmental Anthropologist with CSIRO with 15 years field research experience. So thank you gentlemen for joining us from all parts of Australia. Where are you from, Kewan? Or where are you now? Maybe it's better. <laughs> oh, you're based in Hobart, I'm in Trevor. Hobart, Hello, everybody. The lovely state of Tasmania. Welcome and yeah. thank you for joining us. Uh, and Chris, you're uh, in Australia? Yes, based in Darwin. Nice and warm up here. I, I can imagine it's freezing down here in Adelaide. Marcus, you're. Uh, uh, I'm in Brisbane, actually. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to hear. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Andrew, where are you from again? I reside in Brisbane, but today I'm sitting in Perth. Ah, oh, lovely. Oh, the lovely city of Perth. That's fantastic. But we're going to hand right over to you now, Kewan, and we're in your hands. Thanks so much. Great, Trevor. And I assume you can uh, you see my screen okay? The screen's come across perfectly. And, um, fantastic. You can hear your voice. It's all good. All right. Fire away. Well, thanks, Trevor, and thanks, Icewarm, for this opportunity. And hello again, everybody. Uh, so we have a, a finite amount of time and almost an infinite amount of material we could present. Um, so without any further ado, I'm actually just going to move straight into the presentation. So this is um, the outline of today's talk, which will probably take up to about 30 minutes. Hope to just touch on the drivers for the work, then provide a couple of examples of um, methods and, and the science that we need to employ in order to undertake these assessments across large areas in a short amount of time. Then just break things up a little bit, give a quick demonstration of one of the web-based apps that we developed as part of the assessment before moving on to touching on some of the global findings. Now, unfortunately, there isn't time to go into any specifics in any one particular catchment. So really just looking at drawing upon some of the common messages um, or common themes across the, uh, the three study areas that we looked at. Then just quickly look at some of the other products and then before hopefully, um, yeah, we have a discussion, um, hopefully about 20, 25 minutes of discussion where you'll get to hear from my more learned colleagues, uh, Andrew, Marcus and Chris. So for the benefit of our international audience, and I should say hello to everybody overseas, thank you very much for joining us. Northern Australia is defined essentially here as being that area of Australia north of the Tropic of Capricorn. So it's an area of about 3 million square kilometres, or about 40% of Australia's land mass. Now, of Australia's you know, 25 million people, only about 5% live in Northern Australia, and Northern Australia only has about 6% of Australia's 2.4 million hectares of land that's been developed for irrigation. It does, however, have about 60% of Australia's uh, runoff, 
and the majority of the rivers are unregulated and unimpeded. It also has the largest intact tracts of tropical savanna across the world, so it has considerable ecological value. Now, rainfall is highly seasonal, with the majority of rain falling in four months of the year, especially between about December and, and April. And um, com combined with the, uh, I suppose, the inherently low fertility of the soil, essentially means extensive grazing if the predominant uh, land use with many of the animals um, uh, going to the live export trade. Now, there's been long interest in developing uh, Northern Australia, but certainly in the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a resurgence of interest in developing the water resources of Northern Australia, predominantly for irrigation. Now, despite this ongoing interest, there's been a notable lack of on-ground investment. And on-ground investment requires both the investor and the regulator to have confidence. But history has shown that capitalising on the North's natural advantages has its challenges and its uncertainties, which erode confidence and deter investment. So when investors aren't confident, they invest their money elsewhere. When regulators aren't confident, they inevitably make conservative regulatory decisions. So unlocking new investment requires renewed confidence and certainty about the scale and the nature of the opportunity, but also importantly about the risks that attend that opportunity. Now, one way of improving the confidence of investors and regulators is to provide information at a finer scale than is currently available. So, as an initiative of two recent government white papers, the Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development commissioned CSRO to undertake a comprehensive water and agricultural assessment in three priority regions. The Fitzroy catchment in Western Australia, four small catchments between Darwin and Kakadu, referred to as the Darwin catchments, and the Mitchell catchment over in Queensland. Collectively, this is an area of about 200,000 square kilometres. We're about four-fifths the size of Victoria, uh, about two and a half times the size of Austria, or you know, nearly three and a half times the size of Sri Lanka. Um, and what's more, we were given just 2.5 years to do it. Now, the other point I should make is that this is part of an ongoing series of resource assessments. Prior to this, we undertook a similar study in the Gilbert and the Flinders catchments in Queensland, and we've just been commissioned to undertake another assessment in the Ropa catchment in the Northern Territory. So what's its purpose? Well, broadly speaking, the assessment sought to evaluate the opportunities by which water resource development may enable regional economic development. And it broadly aimed to answer the following questions. What soil and water resources are available? What exists? What are the opportunities? Is irrigated agriculture and aquaculture, and I should say we also looked at aquaculture as well, economically viable? And then what are the trails? Now, in saying what the assessment is, it's equally instructive to say what it's not. So it didn't seek to advocate irrigation development, nor did it recommend one development over another. We're agnostic as to whether development occurred or not. And similarly, we're agnostic as to how development would occur, should it occur. Now, the assessment didn't seek to replace any planning processes and did not recommend changes to plans or planning processes. We're scientists, that's not our space and the assessment did not assume a given regulatory environment. So regulation and, and legislation can change at the flick of a pen. We wanted our information and products to have as long a shelf life as possible. Now, assessing greenfield or uh, new irrigation areas in Northern Australia, as it is anywhere in the world, is complex. So while this was predominantly a soil and water resource assessment, um, we also considered a wide range of other factors, such as what's the existing infrastructure, uh, what are some of the trade-offs, what's the current industries, and um, what are Indigenous interests and aspirations and water values. So as you can see, assessing greenfield sites requires drawing on the skills of many different disciplines. And so to that end, we assembled a team of about um, uh, over 140 uh, scientists, and um, predominantly from CSRO, but we also subcontracted about 20 research partners from the private and public sector. And broadly speaking, the uh, team was broken up into the following activities. So we had a climate activity, a groundwater activity that included managed act for recharge, surface water hydrology activity, included river system modelling and flood modelling, uh, soil assessment, uh, agricultural viability and aquaculture activity, which was led by Andrew Ash, uh, the Indigenous interest aspirations and water values activity, which was led by Marcus, Associate economics activity, surface water storage activity, and an ecology activity that focused on the marine, freshwater, and riparian environments. Now, again, just because of the, the limited time we have in this presentation, um, 
the majority of the common messages I'm going to speak to today are essentially from the ag viability and the economics components, because inevitably that's where we get most of our, our questions. Okay, so one of the challenges of working in Northern Australia is the scarce, scarcity of data. So for example, in the Fitzroy catchment, an area of about 94,000 square kilometres, prior to uh, the Nora assessment, there was but one registered soil sample. Furthermore, the landscape is vast and remote, and these latter two points in particular make the acquisition of new data particularly challenging, particularly when timeframes are tight. Consequently, much of the new science and methods that were used in the assessment were revolved around using methods and developing methods that could rapidly and comprehensively assess large areas in a short amount of time. And I don't mean just remote sensing, um, and you know, basically my experience is that while remote sensing technology has, has come a long way and is improving, it still tends to overpromise and underdeliver. in that when you're actually looking to provide information that's useful to people on the ground, you actually have to get out on the ground. So in this case, it was a case of trying to blend our capacity for undertaking broad scale spatial analysis with on ground measurements and observations. So I'll just give two examples of some of the science. Firstly, how do we rapidly, or how do we assess large areas of soil, um, you know, 200,000 square kilometers in, in a couple of years? Well, to do this, we used a method called digital soil mapping, or DSM, which is, um, and I should say CSRO and others have been developing DSM techniques for about the last 10 to 15 years. But yeah, we've really, um, uh, I suppose, specialized in the area of its application to large areas. And DSM involves assembling a series of spatial data layers, each one of which has some bearing to the soil formation processes of interest. You then use the statistical model that looks at the variability within each of the spatial data layers, the variability across them, and taking into consideration the existing soil samples, it then evaluates the optimal location in the landscape in which to go and sample, in which to capture as much of that variability as possible. You then go and sample at those locations, take your measurements, send samples back to the lab for wet and dry chem, and then you plug those measurements back into the statistical model that uses the spatial data, the spatial covariates, to then model those soil parameters across in the entire area. So in this case, at a 90 by 90 meter grid soil basis, and this is for plant available water capacity to 100 centimeters, but other parameters included minimum soil depth, EC, pH, permeability, drainage, and so forth. And this can be used for a range of you know, hydrological agricultural models, but in the assessment, we predominantly use them to develop land suitability maps, where essentially these soil parameter groups are combined with climate data and a series of rules to develop these land suitability maps that indicate those parts of the catchment that are more or less suitable for irrigated agriculture for a particular land use. And we looked at about, I think it was about 126 land suitability types where each land use was a, um, a crop season irrigation type combination. Now, one of the other strengths of digital soil mapping is that because it's based on a statistical model, it means that you can actually quantify the uncertainties in your predictions something that you can't actually do using traditional soil mapping techniques. Okay, I'll just give a second example, and this is in terms of assessing dams. So again, in a similar vein, we had to undertake an assessment of dams across the entire area, and objectively, not just, just um, you know, picking certain sites based on um, you know, expert judgment. But the way we did this is using a model called the dam site model, which we originally developed in about 2010, but we've been continually refining ever since. And essentially, the dam site model evaluates every location in a catchment for its potential as a dam. And it does this by building, at every location, building a virtual dam wall, including constructing saddle dams as required. And at each one metre height increment, it calculates the reservoir surface area, the reservoir volume, the inflows, the net evaporation, the yield from the dam, and then based on the dam axes and a unit cost approach, it calculates um, the dam cost. And I should say there's also an inbuilt reservoir routing model so that um, we can uh, run design floods through so that we can uh, evaluate what the flood rise would be for different size events so we can properly uh, calculate the height of the dam abutment and the saddle dams, which are then um, incorporated into the dam costings. And so these results can be summarized in terms of the dollars per megalitre or dollars per megawatt hour. In this case here, this is a summary of the results in terms of dollars per megalitre, where basically the bigger the dot and the bluer the dot, the better. No values 
greater than 4,000 are shown, otherwise there'd be dots all over this map. And so then with this analysis, you can then work out where the better locations are in terms of dollars per megalitre, and then you can actually go and do a more detailed analysis at that site. In the case of the Mitchell catchment, we picked out about eight locations. And I'll just point out the Linga catchment, which some of you may have heard is here, um, and uh, we may just visit that uh, very shortly. So I might just take a little bit of a break there, um, and I'll just show you one of our web-based apps. Um, just while I change screens here. So this is what we refer to as the Nora Explorer. And the Nora Explorer um, basically captures a lot of our spatial data and it allows the user to interact with that data. Um, so we can just change the view, we we'll change that to a satellite view. And if I say go to the Fitzroy catchment, Fitzroy, at the moment we have, um, at the moment land suitability is shown, seems to be running a little bit slow, but we can change, um, we can have a look at any type of um, other type of land use. So let's say, let's have a look at what cotton under spray irrigation during the dry season would be. We can change it to that. And then it should just remap. Um, and what you can also do is then you can look at combinations of land use. So let's say we wanted a, we're interested in a cotton mung bean rotation. Um, cotton mung bean, let's go dry season spray as well, add to current. And then it will, based on those two, calculate where the, will provide you a land suitability map based on those two crops. Um, we can go across to say the groundwater tab and we can say, okay, um, show us where, in this case, where the depth to top of aquifer is less than 300 metres and the depth of pumping is less than 20 metres, or the depth to the hydraulic head is less than 20 metres. So the depth of the top of aquifer might be an example of um, the cost that you'd incur uh, as a result of drilling, whereas the depth to the hydraulic head would be an example of the type of cost you'd incur due to pumping. Um, so then you can trade, play around with these transparency tabs. Um, what we can do, we can then lock that and go back to the land suitability map and um, you can then say, okay, well, where might I have a viable gravel resource with um, uh, you know, land that's moderately suitable or better? And I'll just give uh, one more example um, in terms of the water storage. Actually, what I should do, I'll just go back to the groundwater and just turn that off again. I'll unlock that. I should say also options of putting on contours, for example. Um, you can draw cross sections and so forth. Um, if I go to the water storage tab and let's go to the Mitchell catchment now. Now this summer, this captures a whole lot of the information from our dam site model and I'll just zoom into the Malinga catchment. And um, Trevor, maybe while I'm zooming in to the Malinga catchment, you might want to just ask a question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is just outstanding, the vast amount of work that's gone on behind all these easy to see, to see pictures. Um, one, one thing that strikes us uh, is, um, is this data publicly available? Like, is it on a website that people can just uh, go to? So th this app is, is up and live and it's actually is publicly available. So anyone can access it and people have been accessing it. No, that's fantastic. Uh, one of the other things, maybe Marcus, Chris or Andrew might like to also join in. What, what have been some of the outcomes of Nora since the um, uh, since its release? So to date, there's been quite a lot of information exchange. So going around and talking to all the different participants in the catchments, I think we've done about 40 different presentations today at different levels within the catchments and then also with governments and others. Yep. Um, it's part of coming part of the water planning processes in the Fitzroy and in the NT. Yep. Um, and we've had lots of interest from people around potential to invest to understand what's possible in the catchment. Um, and as Kieran mentioned, we're also given the tools applicability, we're being asked to apply it in different parts of the world as well. Um, so not only in Northern Australia, but also in places like Norfolk Island, which we've just started doing some work. So well, that's it's going to interest a lot of, lot of people who are on this, uh, on this mm. webinar today. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in that. Uh, that's great. Marcus, any, any further comments at your end or, or, or Andrew? About um, from our perspective, yeah. yes, the outcome certainly um, from our perspective, it's been um, very powerful for um, 
Indigenous traditional owners to be engaged in the research process and to understand the potential complexity behind the science and also understand where on their land is more or less suitable for these sorts of developments and therefore where they can um, um, undertake their own planning, cultural heritage and cultural management activities in advance of potential future development. Yep. No, so th th these are the questions that I can hear uh, around the traps. And, and Andrew, any, any further comments around the outcomes? Uh, just a quick one, I just want your outcome. Well, an outcome in terms of learning is that you need to understand the whole system from the biophysical resources through to the, the ecological, the, the cultural and social and economic to get the full picture of what, what's possible and, and what might be constrained. Yeah, but I find that, just seeing what you're doing here, I find that a huge step forward. When I think about uh, what the average uh, aware Australian might be thinking about in terms of agriculture in the north, most would uh, most likely think, well, there's been a few unsuccessful attempts there. Uh, are they um, taken into account when you've been doing this? You've probably got at the back of mind probably all the time while you've been doing this. What do you think, Kewen, or...? So maybe I'll hand it to you, Q, and first up. But those unsuccessful ones probably sit in the mind of most average Australians who would, who would have heard yeah. much about it. So, um, actually, that will probably be touching on that next in, in a moment, Trevor. Oh, sure. um, okay. If you're happy to That's do it. And, I mean, uh, Andrew's, Andrew's actually, well, I could almost hand it over to Andrew right now because he actually did a study as part of a food and fibre project which looked at you know, the so called failures across northern Australia. Um, Andrew, do you want to put you on the spot to simply summarise that work? Oh, just that there's, there is a rich history. We've been at this game for over 100 years <laughs> in trying to develop the north. And, well, well put, and well there put. are some, some uh, successes and, and, and plenty of lessons and, and failures in that. And, uh, and I think one of the key ones from all that is, is understanding the environment which you're going to operate in. And it is challenging in the north and, and taking the time to learn the environment and scaling up. Uh, slowly, I think is the key lesson out of all that. Yeah, no, well, no, well summarised. Thank you. Well, look, we'll get back to Q and again. Is there any other comment, Chris or Marcus, you'd like to make, and we'll, and we'll get back to the presentation again? All good. Yep. All right. Well, let's press on then, Q and um, the next part of the presentation. Great. Over to you. Okay. Thanks, Trevor. So, in terms of global findings, um, I suppose before we talk about what was we found was common across the catchments, it, it is pertinent to make this this point. But essentially the scale, nature and the risks of the opportunity that we found in each of the study areas was actually quite different. And hence to understand the opportunity and risks, it, one really does have to look in more detail. So I suppose what I'm saying is that Northern Australia is not this one homogenous area, but in actual fact, even neighbouring catchments, the opportunity and the risks are actually very, very different. Um, so it's, um, it, it, it really does warrant um, more detail um, than you know, just taking uh, broad scale analyses and, and you know, there's no, no silver bullet, I suppose I'm saying. So before I actually start on the global findings, I just want to define the term uh, gross margin for people that might not be familiar with it. Essentially a gross margin is the revenue that you get from growing a crop minus the variable costs of growing the crop. So it doesn't include capital expenditure. So the tractor in this slide here is an example of a capital cost. It is not included in a gross margin calculation, but the diesel required to operate the tractor to sow the crop and harvest the crop is included in the gross margin calculation for that particular crop. Now, in terms of dry land agriculture, um, you know, broadly speaking, across Northern Australia, we found it's been difficult to get positive gross margins on low meal sandy soils. You know, very seasonal rainfall, these soils have a low water holding capacity. Now, theoretically, it is possible to get positive gross margins for some wet season crops on your heavier clay soils. Um, but our trafficability analysis basically indicates that planting during the wet is likely to be limited in many years. So consequently, um, dry land cropping in the north is opportunistic, hence the interest in irrigated agriculture. And so we found with irrigated agriculture, it is physically possible to grow a wide range of crops. And obviously different parts of northern Australia lend themselves better to different options because of variation in soil and climate, water, uh, but, but also importantly, proximity to existing agriculture and infrastructure. So in the five study areas, uh, we found that there was more suitable land for irrigated agriculture than there is water to irrigate it. So essentially water is the limiting factor. So how much water is there? Well, for example, we found it was physically possible to extract about 1,700 gigalitres in Fitzroy catchments in about 85% of years. 
And in the Mitchell catchment, four large dams could potentially release 2,800 gigalitres in 85% of years. Now, if these water resources were fully developed, irrigation would still only occupy 3% of the landscape, but they would result in quite large perturbations to the rivers. So we've established that uh, you know, it's physically possible to grow a wide range of crops under irrigation in the north. The next question is, well, can you make any money? So in the Fitzroy catchment, here we have some gross margins, I should say, for the Fitzroy catchment and for um, the Mitchell catchment. And these are for broadacre and industrial crops. Now, the advantage of broadacre and industrial crops is that they have established export markets. Um, and so basically, you can grow them at scale and have no impact on the price. So in the Fitzroy catchment, you know that the gross margins um, for broad acre crops get up to about $1,000 per hectare. In the Mitchell, you know, around about $1,600, $1,700 per hectare. And the difference here is largely um, due to the proximity of the Mitchell catchment to established uh, agricultural areas on the east coast of Queensland. So the, the input and transport costs are lower. In terms of industrial crop, uh, crops like cotton and sugarcane, well, it's it's, there's potential to get a gross margin of about $2,500 per hectare for cotton if you had a cotton gin at Fitzroy Crossing. The reality is there isn't a cotton gin at Fitzroy Crossing. The nearest cotton gin is at Emerald, a distance of about 3,500 kilometres away. Now, cotton is about 40% lint, so you actually lose a lot of money in transportation costs to the gin. And as a result, um, if you had to transport your, your cotton to Emerald, your gross margin drops to about $965 per hectare. So why don't we just build a cotton gin at Fitzroy Crossing? Well, um, a cotton gin requires about 10,000 hectares of cotton supply to be viable, depending upon the reliability of supply. And herein lies one of the many, many chicken and egg challenges of Northern Australia. What comes first, the 10,000 10, hectares of cotton or the cotton gin? Um, I mean, obviously, there, there may be some alternatives. So if one had a cotton gin at Kununurra, about 670 kilometres away, um, that gin could potentially serve the Ord, Fitzroy Crossing and Victoria, and you, you know, your gross margins would, would be somewhere in between. But those are, those are bigger, broader scale conversations that need to occur across, across jurisdictions. Um, and then we have a similar sort of situation for sugarcane. Again, you can get high gross margins, but that relies on having a sugar mill in close proximity to the, the growing area. Sugar cane is 70% water. So if we now have a look at horticultural crops, you can see their medium gross margins are actually quite high. Um, however, they're really um, limited to a, a domestic market. And consequently, their prices can fluctuate rapidly um, over a weekly, even a daily basis. Now, for example, um, we looked at bananas in, in the Darwin catchments and calculated you could have a median gross margin of about $3,850 if those bananas were supplied to Adelaide. But if you were to grow about 600 hectares of bananas in the Darwin catchments, that would be equivalent to the entire consumption of bananas in Adelaide. And all it would take is a 10% drop in the price of bananas in Adelaide for that gross margin to become negative. So you can see it's, um, you know, it's largely, I suppose, you know, these, these types of opportunities, similar to indigenous bush foods, at this stage can't be grown at scale because there aren't those established export markets. So the next question is, okay, well, we can get a positive gross margin, but is it sufficient to pay off your capital costs of development? Now, here we have some indicative costs, and I will, I will say these are indicative because these costs vary from one catchment to another, and they vary within the catchments. Um, but nevertheless, the general messages um, hold. So here we have some land and water development costs for different water supply and source options. Um, and these correspond with this uh, top axis here. And then here we have maybe a, a IRR or a target return. And these numbers in this table here are the break even gross margins required for a certain land and water development cost to achieve a certain return. So you, if we um, recall in the Mitchell catchment, our gross margins for broad acre crops were about you know, most about $1,600, $1,700 per hectare. You can see even just to get a 1% return on investment, you need to have a very, very low land and water development cost. Hence the interest in industrial crops like cotton, so around about $2,500. You know, if your land and water development cost was about $1,250, you could potentially get a 5% return on your investment. In terms of large stands, basically the best 
uh, large dams across the north, best in terms of um, you know uh, dollars per hectare, is was around about thirty thousand dollars per hectare, and at thirty thousand dollars per hectare. Um, even just a 1% return on investment, you would need to get a gross margin of $3,000 per hectare in 100% of years. Now, in reality, um, you have unavoidable and periodic setbacks due to uh, uh, reliability of water supply, disease and pests. So, for example, if your water was supplied at, um, if you could get your full entitlement in 80% of years, and then in those other 20% of years, you only got half your entitlement, those uh, farm break-even gross margins that are presented on the previous slide would actually need to be 11% higher. So, so what becomes challenging becomes even more challenging. Furthermore, early setbacks have a larger impact on scheme finances. So if you have your setbacks in the early years of the investment period, that has a larger impact than if, that, if those setbacks occurred in the latter stages of the investment period. And why this is relevant is because with greenfield irrigation areas, inevitably there is always a learning curve um, before you achieve your production potential and you're able to minimise your input costs. Um, now there are ways of mitigating against that, for example staging, which Andrew mentioned before, um, where you know, we certainly found that you know, scaling up too soon is certainly much worse than scaling up later. So the idea here is you start small and then you, um, you make your mistakes while you um, you still have some money in the bank and then you scale up as you've, you've learned your lessons. And basically in summary, to get the developments across the lines, and just to quote Richard George from Western Australian Government here, um, you know, you're really looking for your best dirt, your cheapest water and your lowest risk. But we might also add to that, you also want to try and maximise your benefits beyond the farm gate and highest returns. So how might you do that? Well, one way is, is vertical integration, which you know, people may be familiar with. And in this example here for the Mitchell catchment, um, uh, I suppose with, with vertical integration, instead of a, uh, a farmer uh, selling his sugarcane or her sugarcane to a mill, with vertical integration, you have a single entity, in this case it would probably be a corporate investor or a large scale investor, um, that owns and operates the dam, the irrigation area and the sugar mill. So instead of selling sugar cane to the mill, they're value adding and actually selling sugar. Further to that, uh, selling molasses to the local cattle industry and potentially putting energy back into the NEM, um, back into the grid. And if, you know, potentially, um, if all your stars aligned, you might be able to get a return of, you know, 3%, maybe, maybe 4% with, with Cogen, but have a look at the total cost. $3.7 you know, billion, of which $755 million for a dam, $1.8 billion for the sugarcane, for the irrigation area, and one point, nearly 1.3 billion for the sugar mill. So then it's a matter of, well, you know, essentially either investors out there that would be prepared to invest $3.6 billion for a 4% return on investment. Other options for increasing revenue are double cropping and horizontal integration. So double cropping is where you're looking to produce more than one crop from the same field each year. Now, in the Fitzroy catchment, we believe there is a, um, a potential for double cropping. Uh, because it's underlain by a great big vast regional scale groundwater system and there are loamy soils that you could potentially um, um, you know, get on during the wet season. So for example, if um, we, we think it may be possible to say sow some or plant some cotton in the Fitzroy in say January during the wet season, harvest it in, in June, and then in August you plant half the area to mung beans, the other half to a forage, um, and then Essentially, you're, what you're doing is you, you're selling your, your cotton, you're selling your cotton to the gin, selling the lint, and then you're actually feeding your cotton seeds to your cows as a protein supplement as well as some forage. So you're increasing the reproductive rates and growing bigger animals so that you can access markets other than the live export trade. And we found that if you did this, you could potentially increase your gross margins by about 25%. Now that said, double cropping is not suited to all water supply options. So it's suitable where you've got a, a suitable groundwater resource, or potentially suitable, um, because essentially your, the cost of your groundwater infrastructure are set by meeting your peak evaporative demand. It's independent of volume because your water is stored under the ground. However, with a, a ring tank, like a, you know, an earth circular or, or rectangular earth embankment, um, it's not suitable because essentially what we've found is that you're essentially paying to store a whole lot of water that you never get to use because of evaporation and seepage losses. Now, some of these options for increasing your revenue, but basically they're not tested in Northern Australia. The more complex, they're more complex, and the more strongly independent 
um, the greater the risk that underperformance of one component can undermine the viability of the entire scheme. Now, I've spoken mostly to irrigated agriculture. Uh, I will just touch on briefly to aquaculture because there is a, a, a real um, potential for aquaculture in Northern Australia. We found there were large areas of coastal land suitable for lined aquaculture ponds, over 100,000 hectares in each of the three study areas we looked at. And west of the Great Divide of, of you know, in Queensland, there are fewer regulatory constraints than having aquaculture enterprises on the east coast which drain into the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. Now, despite the remoteness and um, distance to market, provided there is existing infrastructure, such as you know, good road transport between Derby and Perth, it is possible to get very high uh, returns or IRs. Um, however, the, the operating costs are very high and often they exceed, the annual operating costs often exceed the initial upfront capital costs. So you know, it's not for the faint hearted. Now, having spoken on the global findings, and largely in the, the ag viability and economic space, I, I also do feel compelled that I should make this point, is that you know, essentially economics is not always the be or an, an end all. You, know, you just need to look through history, and history has shown that you know, governments don't make, don't, often don't make decisions based on economics, or science for that matter, but due to other, at the time, equally compelling considerations. Further to that, investors often have other motivations. Could be speculation about a, a crop price sometime distant into the future, uh, might be to do with land value, minimising risk, as you said, you know, they um, might be irrigating a, a fodder uh, and feeding it to their cows, not so much to increase their profits, um, but potentially to grow big animals, access other markets and minimise exposure to the live export trade. Sovereign risk, people looking to get money out of um, other countries, patient capital, where um, you know, essentially they're not looking at making a, a quick buck, but having a um, you know, looking, look, potentially looking at returns over much longer time frames, and a range of other factors. And I'll give an example here, recreational dam builders. So across the north, we know, in, you know a number of landholders who I've put into this category where they love nothing more than, than hopping on their, you know, their grader or their tractor and pushing dirt around. Um, and to them, the only cost is diesel, now, an economist would say, well, you know, there's an opportunity cost associated with that. Um, but they'll say, oh, no, that's, that's rubbish. You know, this is my recreation. This is what I do for fun. So, and that's essentially why there are these little, um, little developments that do occur and, and pop up around Northern Australia. Now, because there are a wide range of values out there, this essentially provides a good segue into this next slide. Um, and so this is from a piece of work that Marcus and his uh, team did where essentially they classified stakeholders um, in Northern Australia according to their likely support for irrigation development. Um, now, one thing it, it clearly shows, and this was common, while well, this is for the Mitchell, it was also done for the Darwin and the Fitzroy catchments. One thing that it does clearly show is that many of the indigenous organizations and traditional owners actually lie right here in the middle. So they're not necessarily supportive or unsupportive of the irrigation development, but their support or otherwise entirely depends upon the type of development and who benefits from the development, um, which is essentially what that, that first point there is saying. Now, we're running out of time, so I will just finish on this last point here. And that essentially being that, you know, Indigenous people have continuously occupied and managed Northern Australia for tens of thousands of years. And I suppose in short, you know, that they aren't going away. Um, and, and through Marx's work, you know, what, what really has been clear is that they're really keen to be co-investors in future development, as opposed to, for example, just a source of labour. And Marcus may um, speak to that more eloquently um, later. In terms of products, we had a number of, um, I can just get it to change over now. There we go. Um, we produced over 30 technical reports written for a technical audience, and we also produced um, three 500-page catchment reports, which are essentially a summary of the key points from the technical reports. So they don't talk about models or methods, just simply facts and, um, and present information. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to present the information in such a way that the reader can take that information that's consistent with their information needs and their values to answer their own questions, which is really what we were trying to do um, in the assessment as a whole. Now, further to that, we developed three 24-page summary documents um, and three two-page fact sheets 
and also a case study report. And if you're only going to have a look at one of these, um, reports. I'd probably encourage you to look at the case study report. It's probably the, the most engaging in, in that it has some, some storylines and a bit of a story to it. And all of this information is on the web um, and, and readily accessible. You just need to type in, you know, say, Nora and CSRO into your, your search bar and it should pop up. Um, in addition to the Nora Explorer, we've developed some other app, apps. Here's one which I probably have run out of time to speak to, um, but essentially this is a Nora River where the river system models that we developed as part of the assessment were put up into the cloud and we put a simplified uh, web-based front end so that anybody can actually access these models and, um, and basically uh, develop their own scenarios and run those scenarios. And then we've hooked them up to some hydroecological uh, models that were developed as part of the assessment so that people then can make inferences about what that might mean um, to different types of, of species. In, in the catchment. And I'll, um, I'll finish up there. Thanks again to ISWARM and also like to thank the um, Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development for funding the work and all our, our, our collaborators and, and subcontracted research providers. Thank you, Trevor. It's been fantastic. Uh, Q&, Marcus, Chris, Andrew, yep, uh, come, on, come, on, come on screen. Uh, that's just such a huge uh, strategic work that's you've attempted and done well in presenting in such a small space of time. Um, but the, the, the take home messages are very, very clear. The scoping so crucial, uh, you know, starting small, the chicken and egg, egg challenge, the vertical integration, they're just such clear messages. Um, but Nora app is going to be a, a vital bit of, bit of work for um, future uh, development in the north. Um, I, I found myself thinking, I wonder if there's gold mine possibilities in the north in agriculture. You know, this this thought just just challenges me. But obviously, there's there's a, the problems of uh, chicken and egg. You know, you can't do cotton unless you've got a cotton gin. There's a whole lot of things. I'm just picking bits out of what I know. But um, uh, rather than do that, um, uh, just a great deal of thanks to you all four. Uh, and there's and there's a couple of questions we should look at before we go any further. But but uh, but a question here from Nathan in the UK. Uh, did we get an answer? I think we might have. Uh, do you have an understanding of what the groundwater consumptive volumes, Andrew? I think you might have answered that. Is that right? Oh, Chris, sorry, Chris, you answered that already. Yeah, so we just put an estimate in there, and there's also a link in there to the groundwater reports themselves, which give you a better understanding. So, so the volumes are small in the Mitchell, they're large in the Fitzroy, and there's a little bit in the Darwin areas as well. Yep, yep, that's great. Um, the other question was about IRR uh, investment rate of return. Is that, am I get, got that right? Q and IRR. Uh, it's low, it seems to be low, three and a half, four and a half percent seems to be low for sugar production, not economically viable. Andrew, your comment there. Uh, say again. Yeah, okay, I'll just respond to that. Yes, uh, it is low and uh, North Australia is a it's a fairly high cost environment. Uh, the the input cost. Well, Kewan touched on the um, on the the development costs there, and then they're relatively high in that environment. But also the once you're up and operating, the input costs are, are quite high. So to generate it's it is can be more challenging to generate those uh, those high gross margins when you factor in uh, issues that Kewan raised about uh, learning in the environment, and so uh, together. Those returns may not look very impressive, but you've got to keep in context that not much of agriculture <laughs> generates very high returns yeah, uh, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you can look at it in a in a completely investment sense, and you, you probably wouldn't do agriculture anywhere um, if you're just doing it on a, on a straight return basis. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that raises the question: really, is uh, out of the, all this work, is there a um, a, a sense that this will begin to open up the north like the, 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 the common phrase is, make it, you know, a, a, a huge benefit financially for Australia. Look, Q and could kick off. Chris, do you want to take that? That's a great question, Trevor, and you can see why no one wants to answer it. <laughs> right, I thought there was a reticence there. <laughs> yeah, I think what we've done is provided information that allows people to make those decisions. As Andrew said, it's, it's agriculture's challenging and it's more challenging in these areas, but it's not impossible. 
And we see good pockets of agriculture around Darwin in horticulture, and you can expand that now. And there's resources that we've been able to identify that could support that. And so there are opportunities there. And what we hope is that this information becomes part of the understanding of how you could do that and do it well. And there's certainly things you wouldn't do, and you're not going to be overly profitable if you look for single cropping on sandy soil. So it gives you that sense of what's not feasible, but it also gets the boundaries about what could actually work. You know, for the professional, yeah, thanks for that answer, Chris. But for the professional and non-professional alike, if you ask any average Australian, that they'd, they'd say we've got so much country that we can make benefit from. That that was the root of that question, really. Uh, but but the, um, the 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 bottom line is uh, getting it to um, work in an economically viable fashion. I won't go on anymore with that. But but I I was just thinking that there's such a uh, a, a high interest in this. Um, I'm surprised we don't have the, the, the question board absolutely loaded with questions, but there are a few, a few are coming in. Um, but that seems to sit behind most of people I talk to um, uh, about what could we do in the north that would be viable. Anyway, let's get to stuck into this. What are the most viable crops in the Darwin catchment? Are they different to what is currently being farmed? Who would be the best person for that? I'll have a go at that. Well, uh, yeah, just to start off with anyway, the horticulture is already uh, quite a lot growing in, in the Darwin region and um, it's it's grown there because it has proven to be a, uh, a viable crop over a fairly long period of time and, and it's grown uh, sort of more organically. It hasn't had any planned uh, development, you know, large scale developments to, to get it to where it's you know quite a bit contributed to the local economy. So... Uh, and it's not just the traditional horticultural crops, uh, such as mangoes and, and melons, tropical ones that we're familiar with, but that environment is is a contributor, uh, significant contributor of Asian vegetables to the Australian market. So those those crops are there, and I think will continue to to expand if there are the domestic market opportunities. Uh, it was touched on earlier that at the moment we're mostly uh, selling horticultural products into domestic markets and for that sector to grow and, and grow in an environment like Darwin there needs to be some opportunities developed for export markets uh, which can be challenging and take quite a lot of time to develop the, the export protocols with the with the countries in which you're tending to send them to but it's it's doable and people are doing it uh, it, it, it takes time on on other crops uh, there is a fair interest from the from the Northern Territory government in in cotton uh, not necessarily uh, it's, it's viable at the moment in terms of the areas that are currently available uh, because uh, just the scale of, of the, the area that you need for the processing but there is potential there for, for other broad acre crops just to add to that thanks Andrew and it's not not necessarily related to the same question but it is one of the interesting things about Darwin is the way in which that grew organically from the population that was there. And, and one of the messages of the work that we have here is that there are people who want to live in the north regardless of, of other considerations. And that doesn't just include indigenous traditional owners, but it does include a whole range of people. And in a sense, this information is useful for them as future investors. And it may actually be useful for them in, de in, in, in lowering the scale of particular opportunities to something that is tractable for a local population to develop. Um, and that's a really important message in 21st century development as well, I think. Um, the nature of the people who may be developing is changing. And some of the success stories are not where we would have predicted them to be from the past. Um, others are more qualified to comment on that in detail, but it is an important part of the work is it actually underpins a whole range of considerations about the future of the North, not just large scale irrigated agriculture. There's, there's information about resources here of all sorts of uh, kinds. Thank you. I can't believe we've got 55 minutes on the clock. Look, it feels like about five minutes to tell you the truth. It's just, just going through that much highly in Incredibly important stuff. Um, Professor Alex Gardner has asked from UWA, University of Western Australia, in the Fitzroy catchment study, section set seven is about ecological biosecurity, offsite and, off and irrigation induced salinity risks. This is obviously crucial given the biodiversity loss crisis we face. What is the summary view on the biodiversity and ecological costs of Northern Australian irrigation developments. And he goes on to say that wherever we look, wherever we look around the country, irrigation developments 
have substantial ecological costs. Can these be boosted for irrigation opportunities? Can there be the same economic figures provided for those costs? So it's fairly complex. Um, uh, and thanks for your question, Alex. I'll, I'll ask you and to, to mediate how we uh, progress. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll have a, um, a first stab at it. Um, so there's a few questions in there. Uh, I, I suppose um, in terms of a summary view, um, yeah, look, obviously there's been ecological change that's, that's occurred where there has been irrigation and agricultural development, whether it be in the north or, or the south. Uh, but basically it's, it's not our, um, you know, we're not in a position, or it's not our job to say whether that's acceptable or not. Um, you know, essentially we'll, we'll provide the information and it's up to others to, to use that information as they see fit um, and, and interpret it accordingly to their values. Um, in terms of the, I suppose the last question is that, you know, can you, can you cost some of these ecological costs? Well, y yes, and, you know, this is a, a current area of research and there are people working in the space, but it is very difficult to do, well, irrespective of where you are, you know, essentially there's, um, but particularly in Northern Australia, because, you know, as I mentioned before, there's so little data, that even just in terms of soils, there was, you know, just one soil registered soil sample in the whole Fitzroy catchment. Um, so actually trying to put robust numbers around those costs is very difficult. Uh, you know, the alternatives are you try and transpose the costs from one other part of the country, like a, you know, a woodland in Brisbane, and you, you try, and try and transpose that up to a savanna environment up in northern Australia where you've got, you know, tens of thousands of hectares, you, 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 you can't do it. Um, so it, it is, um, I can understand the question, um, but it's a very difficult thing to do, yep. is my opinion. Comments? Oh, just to add to that, I suppose we did have a look at the impacts or do some estimates of the impacts on in-stream. And I think Kewan showed the river model, which shows you some of the impacts when you start to extract water on particular species. So we've had a go at it in-stream. Um, the second part is to consider the scale of what's possible here. So if you look at if everything worked out, the economics worked, et cetera, et cetera, in development, the scale of development would be around 2% of the catchment to be converted into irrigated agriculture. So you're not talking about broad scale dry land farming systems, they're small scale developments. And that's the challenge in doing that is how you would then quantify what impact that would have. Yeah, that's a fairly cru crucial observation. Marcus, Andrew? Uh, just one from me, and it's, it's, it's a wider uh, uh, conclusion, I guess, that the, we have we have made mistakes in the past in in irrigation developments, and I guess we've we've been learning from those, and they're reflected in in one part of the study, which was looking at environment environment and regulatory uh, challenges in in development, uh, because in in place now there are in each of the jurisdictions, and and also through the Commonwealth through the EPBBT Act, there there is uh, the uh, necessity to to seek environmental approvals and and part of the study was to to assess some of the uh, the challenges and opportunities that that sort of a, a legal and environmental regulatory framework might provide so it's not just the the economic costs it's the the other costs that need to be considered yep Marcus you had something yeah look just um, very briefly I think it's fair to say that in this particular study that we obviously did go into more detail you know, on the irrigated agricultural side of those costs rather than um, a detailed analysis of the ecological ones but as we've learned that the lessons from some of that work is actually quite sobering so in terms of um, restraining some of the more bullish estimates about what irrigation potential exists the study is extremely valuable in speaking to that audience and that indirectly actually helps manage the risks to biodiversity by constraining um, the, the envelope of possibilities to what is realistic and as Chris identified, the 2% area. We are, are then in a much better position to think about what the potential impacts of what might happen um, would be rather than imagining um, things at scales that's not actually viable. So we haven't done the detailed work in the same way around the ecological costs. We have just contributed to it. But we've um, we have done the, the other costing in such a way that's very useful for that sort of thinking. We've hit the fifty-nine minute mark here, and I think we're going to have to wrap this up. There's more questions coming in as we've been talking. Matthew Hall, thanks for your question, and Nathan again, thanks for your question. We'll have to take them on notice, um, but but I think we're going to have to take this uh, now to a conclusion um, and say 
thank you to everyone who's been involved and for your questions and for your discussion, and but particularly for yourself, Q and uh, Marcus, Andrew and Chris, uh, really appreciated your time here. Is there any wrap-up comment you'd like to make, like a an, an all-encompassing all, all summary, each of you? We're going to go around a sentence each. How does that sound? Easy to, easy to ask, a bit hard to... <laughs> I should, I'll just say um, it's worth looking online at all the information. So on the SORO website, if you just type Nora in, it's all there and our contact details are there as well. So CSIRO, type in Nora and you'll, and you'll get this. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Andrew? I'll just uh, conclude one, which I made earlier, that, that to really to get the, the best for environment and society from this sort of work, you've got to consider the whole system, and not just uh, individual components of it. Oh, so critical. Marcus? Marcus? Yeah, look, I return to the point. There are some people who've lived in North, Northern Australia for tens of thousands of years and want to go on doing so, and they want to be a part of the solutions in the 21st century economy. How crucial. Kewen, wrap up. For you, Kewen. Yep. Right, I just had you on mute. Um, essentially, uh, I just reiterate what I said before. You know, Northern Australia is not this one large homogenous area, um, and you know, it's actually quite different. And to really understand those differences, you really do have to look at more more detail. Fa um, so you've got to look at detail. Yep. You need to look at more detail. A fantastic summary. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'll just remind everybody again, uh, watching and listening, uh, there's more webinars coming up in the future, and the uh, online courses are there. Uh, you can see on the slide as it comes up in a moment. And uh, and we'd encourage you to go to our, our YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and also our website, uh, Australian Water School. Uh, we will email the recording to you, uh, but keep in touch. We'd love to see you again at a future webinar. Thanks, Kewen. Thanks, Marcus, Andrew, and Chris. Appreciated your time hugely today. So it's, it's bye for now. See you again. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au